What's the truth behind why they, being the powers that be, don't want you to own silver or gold? I was just at my neighborhood swimming pool, having a good time, ran into a neighbor, Ask me what I'm doing now. I said, hey, I've got a YouTube channel where I talk about silver and gold. And he was like, really? I said, yeah, really? He was like, oh, well, that sounds interesting. He's like, why silver and gold? And I said, because I think it's a great investment. You know, it's a great way for people to protect their wealth. And he looked at me cross-eyed like I was crazy. And it got me thinking, why? Why is it that there's this general consensus amongst most people, at least here in the United States, that silver and gold are not a smart use of your money, not a smart investment? Platinum as well. Thank you, Neil, for being here. Hey, coin shop Chris, thank you. We got a snap. I just became very upset the way this guy acted towards me when I talked about silver and gold. And it, again, it got me thinking, like, why is it? Why is it that it's it's discouraged and it's dis disparaged by the general public when we when we talk about what's like the most pure form of money that's on the planet? How were these people brainwashed, I guess you could say. Is that is that a good way to say it? Is that a good way to, to, to a good synopsis of the situation? So I started thinking, right? Well, hey, in 1933, President Roosevelt made it illegal for Americans to own gold. Illegal. If you got caught holding gold as an investment after 1933, you could face like 10 years in prison and the equivalent in today's dollars of a fine of like $250,000. So starting in 1933, even if you wanted to buy gold as an investment in the United States, they made it very, very difficult. So we had a whole generation, and I want you to think about this. Who do you learn from? Most what we learn, we learn from our parents, right? We learn from uh, our grandparents, somebody who's raising us. We observe they were not able to buy gold. They were not able to invest in gold. So it wasn't something that we saw. Where else do we learn? At schools. Well, what do you think? Were they teaching peep kids in school about silver and gold? No. So it's no wonder we had a whole generation from the 1930s on that had no appreciation whatsoever for gold or silver. And then think about it. What happened next? 1971, President Nixon takes the United States off the gold standard. And I thought of this analogy <clears throat> earlier today about that. At that point, the U.S. government was, was tethered to gold. They couldn't just create money out of thin air, but they needed to create money out of thin air. So President Nixon temporarily, temporarily takes the United States off the gold standard. And what do they do? They start printing money. Do you know since 1971 how much value the U.S. dollar has lost once they removed its link, its tether, its base that was in gold? It's lost a substantial a substantial amount of money. But from the perspective of why does the general public kind of look at gold and silver like it's like like in a very disparaging way? Well, think about it. It was illegal since 1933. It wasn't until 1974, after Nixon took us off the gold standard, that it was made legal for you to own gold again. So we've got that whole period Right, And then they make it legal again, but not until they removed the peg of, or, the, or the tether of the dollar to gold. And when they did that, okay, essentially, guys, gold became the enemy of the dollar, became the enemy of the central banks, right? Because they didn't want, if gold did well, that would make the dollar look bad, essentially, and I want to know what you think about this. Essentially, what they did in 1971 was they put gold and silver in jail. They didn't kill it, okay? They could not completely kill silver and gold, but they locked it up in jail. And it sat there, and it's been sitting there until just recently. I'm telling you, there's a new awakening, a new awareness going on, not just in the United States, but from what people are telling me, 
from all over the world, all over the world, okay? It's not a new idea. It's people waking up to what has always been, and that is that gold and silver maintain their value, okay? They put it in jail, right? The United States became the most powerful country in the world, dominant over the last number of decades, and they've kept silver and gold essentially locked up. Not all that, uh, not all that different than how they've locked up all the gold at Fort Knox. That gold that supposedly is in Fort Knox that we're not allowed to see, that we're not allowed to audit the American people. Right? We're just told, trust us, it's there. Don't worry about it. Right? They've kept gold in jail. All right. It's temporary, though. Remember that. It's temporary. Gold and silver, even though they were locked away, right? I sometimes like to say they're sitting over there in the corner. Nonetheless, nonetheless, they have maintained their value. And I'll go back to this. I've said it already today to you, but it's worth repeating. The world has never, do you, do you think the world has ever really gone off the gold standard? John Exter, Exter's Pyramid, formal Federal Reserve governor, who didn't die but what, mate, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, he wrote extensively that gold and silver are the base of all money, the absolute base. John Exter's Pyramid, check it out. It's been there. But back to my neighbor, and these are intelligent people. Look, I live in a middle upper middle class neighborhood mostly college educated people this guy i know has a master's degree which is great i'm not putting down or putting up anyone with any level of education or degree but even what the supposed educated people out there have no idea right 98 percent of them have no clue as to the actual value of silver and gold and you know there's another reason why that's the case. And that's because the financial services industry does not have the ability to make a lot of money by selling gold and silver investments. I've heard the top people talk about this, and I agree, and I know it to be the case, right? They make they make good money putting their clients, their, their, their financial planning clients into mutual funds where they get to skim a little fee, 1%, half a percent, no matter what it may be. They don't have that opportunity with silver and gold. They're going to say, go talk to one of these name brand financial, big name financial firms and ask them about silver or gold, right? They're gonna act like you're crazy, you're outdated. No, we wanna put your money into this mutual fund where we get to make a little bit off you every single year for as many years as you keep your money in that fund. So that's important to remember as well. Not only do we have the government, the central banks, that have a real interest in suppressing, right? Discouraging people from putting their funds into silver and gold. But the financial services industry has absolutely nothing to gain. And if you think those guys are really, look, I, you know, look, just my opinion. But if you think a financial planner from one of the big name companies really has your best interest at heart, no, he's got his best interest at heart, okay? Just my opinion. And not saying that about absolutely all of them, but they are driven by sales. They are driven by commission, not by doing what's best to help you potentially protect your wealth. Again, just my opinion. I'm not giving financial advice. I'm just giving you my experience. And uh, and I do have, a, I would say, a good level of experience uh, in, in dealing with that arena. Now, as we talk about this, let's, let's talk about the good news going on right now, okay? Still in the United States, it's difficult to find anyone who's really interested in talking about silver and gold. It's hard to find uh, camaraderie, which is what we have here. And by the way, thank you for joining me tonight. This means a lot to me that you're here. If you give this a thumbs up, it helps get the word out to more people. So thank you. You are the most important part. I forgot about this, but it's true. The people that come to Ron's basement, I'm telling you, are a little smarter than the average bear, right? We like to dig in a little bit more than the average person. It's Sunday night. You're not watching Netflix. You're wanting to discuss and learn about precious metals. And remember, when it comes to this 
this dissuasion that we have, right? Our, our powers that be, the government, the central banks, and even the financial services industry have an interest in you not investing in precious metals. But the good news, I told you there'd be some good news. The good news is the world is starting to wake up and it's happening at a feels like an ever increasing pace. Look no further than the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Look at the world central banks. The world central banks are buying more gold right now. And this bleeds through to silver, bleeds through to platinum too, absolutely. But they're buying more gold right now than they were buying during a lot of years when the world was still explicitly, officially on the gold standard. Think about that. What are the most, who, let me ask you, who are the most sophisticated in the know financial firms in the world? The brightest minds, the most powerful financial institutions. You better believe that the world central banks rank right up there with anyone. And what are they doing? Don't listen to what they say. Okay, don't listen to what they say. Look at what they're doing. And all the data from the World Gold Council tells us they are accumulating gold at record pace levels. What does that tell us? What does it tell us that, that, the, that the records, right, the official data coming out is showing us that countries around the world are repatriating their gold. They're bringing their gold home. They're calling New York. They're calling London. Maybe Switzerland as well. But I know they're calling New York and they're saying, hey, we want our gold back. Germany started this trend, what, seven years ago when they wanted to repatriate their gold? Or it was 10 years ago and it took like seven years, which people are very suspicious about. Why did it take all that time for Germany to get their gold back? So the central banks are buying gold and they're repatriating their gold. Because you know what? There's this little saying that I know Coin Shop Chris, our good old friend Coin Shop Chris, thank you for being here. This was a snap live stream. Neil, thank you for being here. Okay. Mary's here too. Everybody's here. Is Buddy here? Anyway, anyway, we got to look at what they're doing and not what they are saying and we know what they're doing uh oh oh i lost my notes <laughs> and that is bringing the gold home oh i wanted to say our good friend coin shop chris right the central banks are bringing home their gold that is them saying on a national basis that if we don't hold it we don't own it we want it in our possession because when a foreign country has their gold in new york it can be sanctioned, it can be taken, it can be confiscated, right? They're saying right now, if I don't hold it, I don't own it, send it back to me. And, uh, and, and, and that is called one of the other key, key, big, big, big benefits to owning metal, right? Here's a 10-ounce bar right here. I got it in my basement. It's called counterparty risk. Not, it's not as complicated as it might sound. It means when I hold that silver bar, I'm not relying on anyone else to, to deliver me that value. If you own a stock, an Apple computer or General Electric or whatever, you're relying on them to provide you some value. If you've got your money in a bank, you've got counterparty risk as well because you're relying on that bank to be a good shepherd of your funds, right? That they're going to make smart investments with it. And we know how great they've been doing lately with all the bonds they bought and all the, all the billions they loaned out on commercial real estate that's getting ready to blow up. Silver, gold, platinum, right? If Neil happens to own a couple ounces of platinum, right? And he's holding it in his hand right now. Neil Hahn, the, the platinum guru, he's not relying on anybody else for that value. And that's gold and silver and precious metals are one of the only uh, investments that have that unique attribute. There's no counterparty risk if you hold it yourself. But if you don't hold it, Really, you don't own it. If it's in a vault somewhere, and I'm not dissuading or giving advice, 
But if it's vaulted somewhere, the reality is you have counterparty risk. You are relying on that company that's vaulting your silver, vaulting your gold, that they're going to be good to their word, that it's actually there. And we had a story come out lately. Did you guys hear about that? The the guy who was uh, selling people for decades, uh, American Silver Eagles, uh, Higgins, I don't know, don't quote me on that, but it's something with an H. Anyway, he right got busted because he, I think it was almost a half million or 50,000 American Silver Eagles that people thought they owned. And when finally the investigators showed up and they went to his vault, there were shoe boxes just full of receipts. That's all that was there. And he'd been living high on the hog for a while. Now that's isolated case, right? And you know what? I'm going to touch on that a little bit right now because it's something that I think is very important. There's very little regulation within the precious metal sector. I think it was Lear just got in some trouble. You can Google that. Uh, you know, there's very little regulation. And I do see that as a risk for the people that don't have the if you don't hold it, you don't own it mentality. That indeed, that indeed, you are taking that counterparty risk and it could tarnish the image, right? We hear these stories about people getting ripped off when they are putting money with these these companies, some of which, some of which, just some, advertise like on Fox News and people are investing money with them and they're getting, they're paying like 30, 40 percent too much for the metals that they're buying. Those stories do not help the precious metal sector. I went off on a little bit of a, a little bit of a tangent. We know again here in the U.S. Right, we are we are gaining traction, but still, most people don't really understand the metals. Education is one of the biggest opportunities. Right, that's came out on that State Street local uh, la uh, most recent survey they put out. There's a huge opportunity to educate more people. We know the millennials are buying more and more silver and gold, which is great news. We know there's more women buying silver and gold. That's great news. The one that really is a kicker for me, it's the uh, you talk about how here in you know here in the United States, we are the lone wolf. <laughs> Coin Shop Chris is a lone wolf, <laughs> a lone wolf, right? We are away from the pack, but guys, I'll end with this. It's exactly the opposite when you go to the East, when you go to places like China or India, right? There, the lone wolves are people that don't own precious metals. Heck, in India, the households alone have over three times as much gold just in the households, okay? Just people in their house. Three times as much gold as we supposedly have as the richest country in the world in Fort Knox. So there's a completely different appreciation for the metals. Those are the countries that are now binding together, talking about this prospect of a gold-backed currency. But if you just look at India and China, right, combine their populations, we're getting close to 3 billion people. If you round up, all right, 2.8 billion officially. How many people live in the United States? 330, 340 million people. They've got eight, nine times as many people. And this is what's so exciting. All those people the majority of them love silver, love gold. I'm sure they love platinum too. I don't know for sure, but I would bet they love platinum. We know that India imported like a third of the world's production of silver last year. But what the big kicker is, those massive populations, their economies are growing rapidly. I said this again, I'll repeat it because it's very important. China's just second quarter, their economy grew at only... 6%, okay? They're catching up with the United States. We were celebrating last week that the U.S. economy grew at 2.4%. But what's even more, everything's opposite over there. In the United States, the middle class is getting squeezed, right? Getting decimated, getting eliminated. We have distribution of wealth in this country that is so disgusting. And sure, that's not on the mainstream media because they don't want you to know that the rich people now have more of the wealth of this country than any other time in history. But over there, everything's different. They all love silver and gold. Their middle class is growing. Their economy is growing. 
Look at the big picture. Look at the forest through the trees, okay? Hey, I appreciate you guys joining me tonight. Paul K says, what do we think is going to happen if Japan starts selling the dollar? Uh, that will be bad for the dollar. That will be bad for uh, or good for precious metals. Hello, Mary. Hello, Neil. Thank you guys for being on here tonight. This was a snap, uh, a snap live stream. I just got really triggered. I don't think I've ever said that. I was triggered when I was talking to this neighbor and he acted like I was a nut because I like silver and gold. Like Coin Shop Chris says, you know what? If things get really bad and he knocks on my door, um, I will, I can't use the exact terminology, <laughs> but we'll say, forget him and feed him beans, right? <laughs> Coin Shop Chris says he's going to leave a case of uh, beans on the front porch for anybody who shows up. All right, you guys have been awesome. Thank you for joining me, okay? I'll see you this week. Take care. I'm so, so lucky and so blessed to have the opportunity to talk with you, even on a Sunday night, even at the spur of the moment. Take care, and I'll see you soon.